we will look at Psalm 91. So I want you to find that. And as you do, I want you to picture something with me, if you would. You uh, wake up tomorrow morning. Your alarm goes off. How many of you hit snooze at least one time when your alarm goes off? Okay, a few. How many right away when the alarm goes off, you're ready to get up? Okay. How many of you don't even set alarm? Your body just wakes you up. Now, looky there. All right. So you are asleep. Your alarm goes off and... You may do this every morning, you may not, but you uh, pick up the phone. Usually that's where we have our alarms these days. Some don't, but you pick up the phone, and right away you start seeing messages that come across. It's been an interesting night. The, uh, there's been ki people killed in Kansas City. Uh, the stock market has plunged as of last week. There are scandals that's going on, you know, in government. This official got caught doing this. All kinds of stuff happening. Have you ever been tempted that before you even get out of bed, you just kind of want to cover your head up and be like, do I really have to face today? I mean, I haven't even got to my problems. I've just read about everybody else's problems. I haven't even got to my problems yet. The, the job that I may go to, maybe financial struggles that you may be facing, or perhaps things that your children are doing that are concerning you, maybe problems in a marriage, or even what bothers a lot of people, just the idea of what may happen, what might take place. And we live in a world that can oftentimes be scary, can it not? And yet, I believe there's one thing that separates us as believers from those in the world. Those that you may work with that are unsaved, perhaps people that you would come across. And I think it could be really defined in one word, and that's this, hope. Hope. We have something that they wish they had, they would like to have. And, and biblical hope is not wishful thinking. I know the world thinks of it that way. It's just kind of a, a wishful way of think, uh, thinking. It's not getting lucky in life. Well, you know, I got lucky in that, or I was lucky to get that job. No, it is, it is biblical hope in something, specifically someone. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. That's important. And when the Apostle Paul himself was giving counsel to Timothy, this young man who he had really mentored in the faith, he knew there were things Timothy was afraid of. Perhaps the greatest was going to Ephesus and pastor this large church in Ephesus. That would have been a daunting thing if you know anything about the church in Ephesus. And Timothy, Timothy had been raised in a small town, and now he's going to this bustling city of Ephesus, not to pastor a little church, but a big church. And Timothy's supposed to lead this whole thing. You talk about fearful. He probably was. And remember what Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1 7. Hey, Timothy, God has not given you the spirit of fear. He hasn't. And Paul wanted Timothy to live with, uh, with hope. And I believe that as Christians, we need to live with hope today. Um, we've been going on Sunday nights through this thing of how do we live courageously in a culture that is against Christ? Courageous Christianity in a, in a Christless culture, really. How do we do that? You know what the key is? Hope. Live with hope. Because God has all the answers to our fears. And that's why I wanted you to go to Psalm 91. Now, Psalm 91 really is a, a, uh, just a view of who God is. And I want you to notice about this because oftentimes our fear is almost always based on future things that we don't know whether they're happen will happen or not. We fear things that we don't know, and we're afraid of what may be coming, uh, but more often than not, we're afraid of what we don't know about the future. And so notice the psalm here, and I won't read all of it, but notice the first 10 verses. It says this, "...he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord..." He is my refuge and my fortress. We, we looked at that word in Sunday school this morning. My God, in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the, the noise and pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night nor the arrow that flieth by day nor for the pestilence that walketh in the darkness nor the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh unto thee. Only with thine eyes shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy 
habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. You know it's important in the world that we live in, when you wake up and you read the news, or we're tempted to fear of what we don't know what, ha what may happen, it's important to have your confidence and hope in the right place, and that's the person of Jesus Christ. Because fear is often based upon the unknown, we allow our minds to wander. That's why in Sunday school we were encouraged to bring those thoughts into captivity because if we feast on those thoughts, we will begin to, to be controlled by our fears. A while back, uh, the Gallup organization, which does quite a bit of polling, asked 13 to 17-year-olds what they were most afraid of. It's interesting. In the top 10 fears, here's what they were. Terrorist attacks, spiders, being killed, not succeeding in life or being a failure, war, heights, crime or violence, being alone, the future, and nuclear war. You know, you, as you read those, what's interesting is a lot of those things is the unknown. They, 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 some of those things haven't even happened yet, or they don't know if they will happen. Nonetheless, in the maybes of life, they were still fearful about that. They were still afraid. But the, the reason here in Psalm 91 that we read this is because do you know that there really is no future with God. In that I mean this, uh, the, uh, God doesn't deal with time the way that we deal with time. See, we worry about future events, God lives outside of that. He is in control of that. We live inside of time, and so we think of what may happen this week, what may happen next month, what may happen next year. But see, God made time. God, see, God created that. We, he lives outside of that. And so we know that God knows everything about what we would know as the future. God knows all of that. And he's in control of that. And so I believe what we're being reminded of here in Psalm 91 is there's no reason to fear. Uh, there's only reason to have hope because God is already in control of everything. He even controls the time in which we live. But I wonder, as a believer tonight, maybe there's some things that you're afraid of. Maybe there's a future that... You're not sure about what could take place, and the world looks for so many different things to cope with all of that. And uh, to think that there weren't people in the Bible that weren't afraid would be, would be a mistake, because there were. Do you know in the Bible, more than 300 times we're told not to fear? Fear not. It is the most frequently repeated command in all of Scripture. Fear not. The word afraid occurs more than 200 times. The word fear more than 400 times. And we oftentimes look at the Bible as filled with heroes, and it is, but they weren't fearless. They struggled with fear. More than 200 individuals in Scripture are said to have been afraid of something. David, Paul, Timothy, many of the biblical heroes that we have would be ones that struggled with fear. And so to drive out that fear, what they wanted and what they desired was uh, a, to increase in their knowledge of God, to, to shift their focus from the present fear that they faced to an almighty God, to an eternal hope that replaced what they didn't know about the future with someone who did know the future, and that's God himself. And so they put away that childish thinking of being afraid of things that we don't know about. As a matter of fact, I believe that it's Jesus' desire that we don't live our lives controlled by fear, but by hope. He said in John 8, 32, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I believe that's free of fear. I believe that's free of, of uh, bondage to sin, and fear can, be, can bring us into bondage. But some things that we know about God, God's good, we know that God's love, we know that God desires that we have a, a future that is filled with hope. We know here in Psalm 91, he said he is our refuge, he's our fortress, he's our shield, he's our defender to all those who trust or place their hope in him. And so tonight I'd like to ask us this question, are we living a life filled with hope? And so I'd like for you to go to Mark tonight, Mark chapter number four. Mark chapter number four, because we all are going to face days. Maybe you say, uh, pa Pastor, it's been more than, more than days, it's been months, it's been weeks, it's been years, where I've really lived in the, in the midst of a, of a storm. 
And there hasn't been much hope. Have you noticed that it seems like when it rains, it pours? I, uh, I, you know, sometimes as a parent, you'll have a child that gets sick, but then on top of that, something else happens. And then on the way to take care of that, something else may happen. Um, th this happened uh, uh, recently. There was a, a situation and something happened and so you try to get hold of your spouse and you call and they don't answer. And so you call and they don't answer and you call and you call and they don't answer. And you notice how quickly our mind goes to the worst. Like, oh my, what has happened? And it, it seems to be compounded when a lot of things happen at once. And, and that can be true in your, in your family life. That can be true in your work situation or even in your personal life. When multiple conditions gather in our life, in our finances, in our relationship, and in our health, we begin to really question, how much more can I endure? So you wake up in the morning, you look through, and you read about all the news that has happened that maybe it doesn't involve you, but it may, may a little bit deal with some things you're facing, and then you start hearing things happen to you, and you just kind of want to pull the covers over your head and be like, oh, I don't want to face this anymore. Well, can I, can I remind you tonight, in Mark chapter number uh, four, Jesus and the disciples are facing something similar. Well, the disciples are. Jesus isn't too worried about it. Why? Because he, he knows what's going to happen. He, he's in control of these situations. So in Mark chapter number four, and I'll find it here. I'm trying to get to it. I was in Matthew. In Mark chapter four, beginning in verse number 35. Go down there with me. You'll, you'll know the story. It says, in the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he, Jesus, was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish. So, question for you, were the disciples fearful in this situation? Absolutely. They were very afraid. And this wasn't necessarily a, a healthy fear that they had. You know, healthy fear is good. I mentioned my brother-in-law a week or so ago, who I would say has a healthy fear of heights, and so he keeps it from getting him too close to the edge of something. And we can have a, a, some healthy fears. But Oftentimes fear becomes something that we're a slave to and we just focus on those things and in God's word we can see instructions given about that. We can see commands given about that not to be afraid. But in Mark chapter 4 what we really see is guidance on how we deal with storms that come into our life. So notice first of all I want you to see this. There is probability not only is there probability but there is a very high probability of storms coming into our lives it's going to happen um we see it happening with with heroes in the bible we see it happening in the lives of, of the disciples and the the the, the, the uh, gospels cover this account mark covers it very detailly detailed because obviously it stood out to him as something that happened but re, uh, the Gospels record just back around here that in this story, Jesus has really come to near exhaustion. He has been busy ministering to people. He has been preaching. He's been healing. He's been doing all of this. And, you know, because he is God and yet he limited himself as man, he got tired. And that, that's happening here. He is coming towards the end of the day. And the disciples were also dealing with exhaustion. They had been going through just time after time, meeting with people, talking with people, seeing Jesus heal people. The crowds had been overwhelming. I mean, there had been people coming to see Jesus, many of them sick, many of them craving just to have a, a moment with the Lord Jesus. And so the disciples have, have watched all this, and I imagine they're emotionally exhausted. Jesus, physically, he is exhausted. Now Jesus is speaking near the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and you remember the crowds begin to press so much that he's forced back and back and back. And he gets into a, a boat. He pushes out and he sits down. He continues teaching, but the time he, by the time he finishes, it's, it's evening. And uh, as I said, Mark goes into great detail, spends almost 30 verses discussing 
this event, the teaching and all that takes place. But what we see in Mark 4, really getting down to verse number 38, is all of these details coming together. It just wasn't one of them. Maybe the exhaustion, maybe they could have handled that. Or perhaps um, if they weren't so exhausted, they could have handled the, the people. But it seems like the people and all that they have faced and all the needs that people have and the physical exhaustion and the time of day that they are, it's like the storm just all comes together at one time. They're tired physically. They're tired emotionally. They have experienced extraordinary things with the Lord Jesus. But it's nighttime. You ever notice you get a little grumpy at nighttime? I mean, you've had a long day and not everybody's been kind to you at work. And, and perhaps uh, you get home and somebody says something to you and before you know it, it sets you off. And maybe at times before that it wouldn't have done that. But now it happens. And I think that's what we face. We've got to realize these disciples are human. And they have gone through it. They're tired of hearing about everybody else's problems. they got problems of their own. And maybe they wanted some time to share that with Jesus. But all of a sudden it happens. They get out into the boat. They're, they're going to pass over into the other side. Typically they probably would have set out earlier than this. But because of all that has taken place. The Bible says that this windstorm. Mark uses a Greek word for windstorm that really can be translated a, a hurricane. It was a, uh, Matthew described it as a seismos or an earthquake. And so the, the sea was actually be, being shaken by this wind and the waves. There is fatigue, there's confusion, it's dark, there's a tempest. And so all of this is happening, their fears are being expounded. How is it possible to place their hope in God in the midst of this storm? But what we're reminded of is this, we're all going to face storms. And we don't know when they're going to happen. They don't always happen when we maybe plan for them. Uh, they don't always happen perhaps when we're all rested up and ready to go. Oftentimes those storms can come at the least expected time. But, but notice the, the paradox of this storm, and that's this. The disciples are actually following the will of the Lord Jesus, and the storm still comes. Jesus says, hey, let us pass over into the other side. They're listening to him. They're hearing his word preached. And like great disciples that we ought to be, they say, yes, Lord, we will follow you. Maybe because they're tired, they say, you know, we'd rather get some rest before we do this. Let's wait till morning. But they're following the Lord in the middle of God's will. And yet they are placed in the middle of a storm. Did that mean that God didn't love them? Oh, no, they're going to find out that he does. Because who was it that said, let's go? Jesus himself said that. Let's go. Let's let us go unto the other side. And so without hesitation, these disciples get into the boat. And now they're really faced with what the, they thought could be imminent death. They, they were fearful so much, they thought they could die. But you'll remember, up to this point, they have determined to follow Jesus. But if you'll remember... It really hasn't cost them much. Up to this point, the disciples have, yes, they've given up their, uh, their, their jobs. They have, uh, they've given up some things. They've, they've, they've endured some criticism from some religious leaders, but not, not a lot up to this point. But up to this point, they feared nothing life-threatening. That's going to change this night. They are going to come face to face with death they are going to come face to face with a storm in their life that they had not expected, that they had not planned for, and they were in the center of God's will when it happened. But that is an interesting thing about the Christian life. Trusting Jesus doesn't mean that there won't be storms. It doesn't mean there won't be turbulent times. But it does mean this, he's fully aware of everything that is going on. The disciples weren't aware of everything that was going on, but these storms were not sent as a punishment for them. These storms were not because of disobedience. Wow, you didn't get in the boat, so we're going to bring a storm into your life. No, that's not the case. They had been following the Lord. They had been listening. They had been ministering Him, and Jesus said, let's go. They went, and yet there still was a storm. But I want you to notice what the Bible says, specifically in verse number 38. And this is comforting. It ought to be comforting to us. And he was in the hinder part of the ship. 
You know where, uh, who was there in the midst of the storm? Jesus was. He hadn't left them. He, he, hadn't, he, he hadn't left them to perish. He hadn't left them to die. Jesus was there. Jesus was in the storm. But these disciples are going to face a test. Our degree of fear is a, really a gauge of our degree of our faith. Do you know when we maybe are most fearful, it ought to be the time that our faith is most evident. But oftentimes that's when we turn back and we rely on ourselves. But there is deficiency in ourselves. We, we often think too highly of ourselves. But we sometimes question, you know, when I go through a trial, is the Lord going to be there? If I'm in a crisis, does He really care about me? And that's what the disciples say. They actually voice this. We think it. We wouldn't necessarily say it with our words, but they say it in the end of verse number 38. And I've said this before in preaching on this passage. Perhaps the most thoughtless thing that was ever said to the Lord Jesus. Master, carest thou not that we perish? Now, we may look at another human being like, don't you really care what I'm going through? But to say that to Jesus Christ, who really was coming to give his life for them, he cared about them so much, he was going to die in their place, and yet they are bold enough to look at him and say, don't you care? Now, listen, how many of us have said that, maybe not in our words, but in our lack of faith and trusting God in a storm that we face? Or we say, Lord, don't you know that I'm here? Don't you know, understand what I'm going through? Yes, he was there. But there's something they didn't realize. I think they lost sight of who was there. God was in the boat. God was right there with them. John Patton, he was a Scottish missionary and labored a lifetime among murderous natives in, in uh, the, the New Hebrides Islands. Often, often in what he wrote, he was faced with danger. Various tribesmen sought to kill him. He wrote this. I thought it was interesting. Without that abiding consciousness of the presence and power of my dear Lord and Savior, nothing else in all the world could have preserved me from losing my reason and perishing miserably. You know what he knew? God was there with him. I was thinking about that with... Um, Brother Troel there in, uh, just in, in, in um, Iraq. You know, how can a person go to a place like that where, I mean, you know they're against you. He knew the Lord was with him. He knew the Lord had sent him there. So he, there, there may be times you, you feel alone in a storm that you're going through, but can I remind you, like Jesus is about to remind the disciples, you're never alone. We are never alone. His comfort, Patton recalls, his comfort and joy sprang from the pro this promise, Lo, I am with you always. And so apparently up to this point, the disciples, yes, they have appreciated what Jesus has done, but in reality they have viewed him as a man much like themselves. But uh, this, this storm, this storm that is going to take place <coughs> really at a point in their life where they needed to see this, is going to allow them not only to see him as a man, but to see him as God. And what God could only bring. And so, notice what takes place in verse number 38. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, uh, by the way, I wonder who got that job. Who gets to wake him up, you know? He's been working, sleeping. I mean, he's been busy. And nobody, I mean, he is just asleep. Who wants to wake that up? I don't want to do that. Somebody had to. They wake him up and they say those words. Cast, uh, Master, carest thou not that we perish? He immediately arises and notice, he rebukes the wind, and that is a very serious rebuke there, and said unto the sea, Peace be still, and the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. You know, in the midst of the storm, the disciples were about to find there still can be peace. There still can be peace. The crisis comes to an end. They're fearful of their life. They're fearful of the storm. Uh, you can just picture, I mean, it's like they're, they're thinking death is imminent. But Jesus Christ has power over all of that. In a miraculous display of power, Jesus Christ steps up and with, with just words, three words, peace, be still. He calms the storm. 
Right before the disciples' eyes, they see this supernatural working. By the way, when he calmed the storm, it wasn't like the waves just kind of went down to a, uh, just a slow, rip. no, it was, it was calm. It was like glass. There's no more wind. There's no more waves. Um, meteorologists and others will tell you, after a storm passes, it could take days. For the, 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 the waves to die down and everything churned up to die down. Not when Jesus is there. He just spoke those words and instantaneously it takes place. So during their three years of following Jesus, these men had witnessed some great displays of God's power. They, they were shown displays of God's power. And this is one of those times, I believe this is the, the really one of those crucial periods where there was a turning point where they don't just view Jesus as this, this, this wonderful teacher and this guy who they're following, but this truly, and we'll see that at the end of the passage, this truly is the Son of God. And I think it is important for us when we oftentimes lose spiritual sight and we go through storms in life, that we put our hope in Him, the one who is above all of that. He doesn't operate in time. He knows. And He lives outside of that realm. And yet He sees what we struggle with and He wants us to trust Him. He doesn't want us to live in fear. As believers, He wants us to live with a hope that He's in control. And not only is He good, but He is always good. In every situation, even in the midst of the storm. Many of you know to, uh, will know the name Johnny Erickson Tata. She was uh, paralyzed and really has been an encouragement to many people. And yet she often says that there's times of struggle where she'll pray. And she wrote this. She'll, she'll pray something like this. God, I cannot do this. I cannot do this thing called quadriplegia. I have no resource for this. I have no strength for this. But you do. You've got resources. You've got strength. I can't do quadriplegia. But I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. I have no smile for this woman who's going to walk into my bedroom in a moment. She could be having coffee with another friend. But she's chosen to come here to help me get up and get ready. And then she said these words. God, could I please borrow your smile today? You know what she recognized? I can't do it, but my hope is not in me. It is in, in God. And aren't you thankful that God is loving and patient with us, even in the midst of our storms? But know this, in every storm, there's a purpose for it. Um, I don't know as you read this passage that you can really come to the conclusion that Jesus tried to do this to the disciples to, do, to prove a point like... I'll show you guys when you're really tired and when you're at your weakest moment, I'm going to bring a storm. I don't know that's the reason that this happened. The Bible doesn't give a direct answer, but can I say this? Jesus Christ doesn't have to create storms to demonstrate his power. He doesn't, he's, he's not, he doesn't need to do that. But I do believe he will use every storm as an opportunity to teach us. And so he's quick to respond to the storm and it's a teachable moment. So he arises, he rebukes the, the wind and the sea. He says, peace be still. The wind ceases and there was a great calm. And so now we could say the power of a teachable moment. He is going to look at the disciples and he's going to say these words. And I believe he could say it to maybe someone here tonight that is facing a storm. Maybe everything's coming together and uh, you just have lost hope and lost sight. He says this, why are you so fearful? How is is it that she have no faith? Someone wisely said this, you are in one of three cases. You're either heading into a storm, you're in a storm, or you're coming out of a storm. And if you look at your life, that's often true. And God doesn't need to create storms in our life to prove a point, but He is going to use storms in our life to demonstrate His power, His strength, and to demonstrate the faith we should have. C.S. Lewis said this, God who has made us knows what we are and that our happiness lies in Him. Yet we will not seek it in Him as long as He leaves us any other resort where it can even plausibly be looked for. 
while what we call our own life remains agreeable, we will not surrender it to him. What then can God do in our interest but make our own life less agreeable to us and take away the plausible source of false happiness? You know, the point is, is he's saying, listen, what God can do is get us to the place where the only way we have to look is up. The end of our rope. God, can I say this? God knows that we need him. We just need to be reminded that we need him. God knows that we cannot do it without him. David said this in Psalm 119. Remember, he said, it's good for me that I have been afflicted. That was good for me. Why? Because I can learn more about you. I can know your statutes. I can, I can know your commandments. That was good for me. And that's what this storm is going to do in the life of the disciples. It, uh, th- this storm that is God's going to use to teach the disciples is going to be a storm that God has purpose in and he wants to produce something out of it. And so notice he asked them the question, why are you so fearful and how is it that you have no faith? Um, one thing I noticed that's interesting as I looked at this passage again, do you notice that Jesus was pretty forceful with the storm? Peace be still. And he rebukes the wind. I mean, it is a, it is a firm rebuke, but Jesus was very gentle with his disciples. Simply asked them a question. Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? You get a sense of even a tone in his voice. I mean, he rebukes the wind. I just, it, it is a firm rebuke to that wind. And even maybe boisterously says, peace be still. But I sense a different tone as he looks at the disciples. By the way, they're standing there in amazement. I mean, they can't believe what they've just seen. And he says this, why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? With these questions, Jesus is revealing a a key spiritual faith. Uh, The opposite of faith is not unbelief. The opposite of faith is fear. That's what they have. They they have fear. And he was was there. Whatever fear you face, he's there. And so Jesus then, what's interesting, replaces their fear with more fear. You say, wait, wait a minute. Let's see that. Notice verse 41. And they feared exceedingly. Hey, if you think they were fearful in the storm, it just got ramped up double or triple. They feared exceedingly. Let me, let me, uh, let me um, give you another definition. They're terrified. They're scared. They're, they're really scared. They feared exceedingly. And at that point... The disciples really, I believe, gained sight into what what Paul said in Colossians chapter 1. Listen, by him were all things created. By him all things consist. I mean, he's the one that that, that, uh, is able to create. He's the one that is able to calm supernaturally. And so the disciples very quickly, in Mark chapter 4, go from being self-centered to Christ-centered. It's all about them. They're fearful for their lives. They're fearful for dying. There's, there's really no hope. But they're, they're at the end. And now, notice, their fear goes from that to faith in the one who is able to calm their fears. And they look at each other, terrified, and say one to another, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Can I remind us tonight that that same person that was in that boat on the Sea of Galilee is right here with us tonight? In 2022, as you pull out your phone and you look at all the news, and it's like, wow, <laughs> that's bad. As you open up your, your bank account and you're like, wow, that's even worse. <laughs> I mean, whatever the case, or, your, or things going on in your family, you know what? Listen, he's here. And he doesn't want us to lose hope. Because there's always promises to hold on to. There there is always hope. See, the disciples, uh, they didn't know necessarily what was going to happen, but Jesus knew their destination. He'd already told them that. They'd forgotten about that, and I always think it's interesting. In verse number 35, when he said, let us pass over onto the other side. If I told you that and we got in a boat, you might be in trouble. I'm not the... I'm not the best on the water, okay? But if Jesus says you're getting over, you're getting over to the other side. 
They'd forgotten about that in the storm. But all you have to do is go to chapter 5 and verse number 1, and almost as if, just throws this in, and they came over to the other side. Hello? That's what he said would happen. Did you know that? He already told them that. And they thought their lives were going to end, but God, in his word, had assured them that there would be a safe landing on the other side. Can I remind us tonight? Listen, God's already promised us as believers there's going to be a safe landing on the other side. Now, we don't know everything that will happen in between. But there's going to be a safe landing. And as a matter of fact, we understand that in the ultimate destination. But could I say too, even in the temporary destinations, he says there's going to be a safe landing. And all we have to do, perhaps even at Thanksgiving this last week, you look back on just this last year, some things that God brought you through. Some trials that you faced, some storms that you were in. So yeah, there's, there's safe landings on temporary destinations, but oh, although death is certain, aren't you thankful that there is eternal life that is promised to those? And what's interesting is, as you go through history and you read about folks that came to the end of their life, even in the midst of persecution and facing storms, many of them faced death without fear. If you've never read Fox's Book of Martyrs, I'd encourage you to do it. I mean, about ready to be burned, about ready to be impaled, about ready to all these things happen to them, and yet with boldness they had hope in God. How is that possible? Faith. How God wants all of us to live. James tells us that our lives were, were tossed about uh, like, uh, like the sea that's driven about and tossed by the wind, and yet he says there that we ought to count it joy when we fall into trials. Not not when, but, or not if, but when we fall into trials. Because it's going to happen. They're, they're, very, they're very evident in our lives. But God has assured them they're going to get to the other side. God also has assured them of something else that we need to be reminded of. The Savior's on board. He was on the boat. The, the disciples were very experienced when it came to boats and the sea, but they were inexperienced. When it came to some fears that they were about to face, because they say in those verses, but, but he's sleeping. Doesn't he care? Oh, yes. Yes, he's told us that he'll never leave us or forsake us. He's told us, lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the age. Adoniram Judson was America's first foreign missionary. He devoted his life to God's service. And yet he lost his wife. And then three months later, their infant daughter, Maria, was, uh, her life was taken. He was overcome with grief. He had been away doing his father's business during his wife's illness, and he found it nearly impossible to forgive himself. And he wrote these words, God is to me the great unknown. I believe in him, but I find him not. And for quite some time, he Struggled with loneliness, but one thing you'll find as you read about his life, he never lost faith in who Jesus Christ, oh, faced some very serious storms. There were some fears, but he recognized that God was his refuge, his strength. He was a very present help in trouble, and what God's Word affirms to us is that faith will drive out fear. Remember what David said in Psalm 56, 3, what time I am afraid? I will trust in thee. Isaiah said, I will, I will trust in and not be afraid. And that's what we need today. We need, with, with all the fears that people face and the folks that don't live without hope, we need a faith that is one that is placed in Almighty God who's able to drive out fears. Spurgeon said this, If you have a faith that helps you deal with fear, good for you. But why not go after a higher grade faith that is fear resistant? When the disciples stepped into that boat with Jesus, they didn't even have that, that uh, faith that helped them with fear. They were trusting in much of what they could do themselves. But when Jesus wakes up and Jesus calms the storm, they realize, they come to the realization that Jesus Christ is who He says He is, and their faith is taken to a new level. And you know what happens in the life of the disciples? 
They become a fearless group of men that go forth. God still works in them. There's still some things that he chisels away at. But the majority of them lost their lives as martyrs for Jesus Christ. You know why? Because I believe the turning point was in Mark chapter 4. Oh, they had followed the Savior. They would came to know the Savior. They'd follow them with their words. But in Mark chapter 4, they truly experienced a faith that was able to cast out fears. And they said, I, I don't know what manner of man is this, but that's the one I want to follow. And today I'd encourage us tonight in the midst of whatever storm you may face, in whatever thing that you go through, in whatever fear that you worry about in the future that we don't even know whether it'll happen or not. Can I encourage us tonight to call on God in the midst of it? And grow through it. Allow His Word to affirm us that He's in the boat. We're going to get to the other side. And there are promises that He wants us to hold on to. So tomorrow, you may wake up and the United States has been attacked nuclear. That could happen. I don't know. You may get a call and a loved one has passed away. You may, you may get a call and the job situation is in jeopardy. Can I encourage you to allow faith to drive out fear? Because there is still a God who's in all and He's over all. And He wants to be our refuge in our strength in what today is a very, a very much time of trouble. And He is that present help. So Father, tonight, I pray that You'd help us to be a people that is willing to allow faith to control us, not fear. And um, I, I know that there are, oh, there's so many things that happen in our world. There's so many things that happen in our life. There's so many things that happen with our health. And what an opportunity to our faith to be, for our faith to be ratcheted to a new level. Where we allow faith to lead the way and we choose to walk by faith, not by sight. Walk by faith, not by what our emotions tell us to do or what may feel good or what may make sense to us. But walk by faith. And thank you for the example of these disciples who struggled with fear, much like we do. But they did learn to trust in the one who was able to conquer and cast out all fears. So Lord, tonight, you know our hearts, you know the fears we may have, you know the things that may trouble us at night, maybe they cause us to lose sleep. Perhaps they worry us throughout the day. Maybe they have happened. Perhaps we don't know if they'll happen. But all oh, that we, we would be reminded that you've promised that we'd make it to the other side. I pray if there's one here tonight that doesn't know you as their Savior, that, Lord, they would um, trust you, that they would know that you are for them and you're in the boat, ready to carry them to the other side. With heads bowed, eyes closed, could I ask this question tonight? How many would say, you know, the Lord knows what it is, Maybe it's something that others may know about, but even if not, the Lord knows some fears that I have, some things that my mind struggles with, some areas where I do need to step out more in faith and trust God. And you'd say this, in, in real humility, Lord, you know what that is, but tonight I'm acknowledging that. Would you quietly slip your hand up? Many hands tonight. Could I encourage you tonight to do something? Maybe it's been a while since you've responded in an invitation. There's nothing magical about the altar. There really isn't. But there is something supernatural about God's grace being poured out when we're willing to humble ourselves. So maybe tonight, on bended knee if you're able, if not, you can come, you can stand. Would you just say, Lord, you know what my fear is. You know my heart. You know the things I struggle and the things I worry about. And Lord, you told me to cast all my care upon you. Tonight, once again, I'm thanking you that you're in the boat, that I'm going to make it to the other side, and that you're a God that is a refuge and a very present help in my trouble. So, Father, tonight, I pray that you do the work that only you can do. Lord, we, we need to be believers that live with a hope that the world sees. Too often, we are trapped in the same mindset of thinking, and we get to 
worrying and fearful about all that's happening and get our mind in the wrong place. And yet, as we looked at Psalm 91, the desire was that we look to you and lift you up. And we would dwell there, dwell in our thoughts in a place where you're exalted and our faith and trust is in you. And so help us to move beyond fear to faith. With heads bowed, eyes closed, you can quietly stand to your feet. Holly's going to begin to play. In whatever way, if God spoke to your heart tonight, would you respond to him? Lord, I'm casting this before you. I'm trusting you in this situation. Help me to think biblically. Respond biblically. And trust you completely.